Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here today. You can be turning to Matthew chapter 13 if you have your Bible. If you're visiting with us, as Tony said before, it's a great honor and privilege to have you here. Uh, We are a group of people that have some core beliefs about Jesus, salvation, and the scriptures, and we want to share that with you. Uh, it's much, uh, our, our community is much larger than this Sunday morning gathering. It's a day-to-day uh, involvement in each other's life to help each other become more like Jesus. So we urge you to stick around. You'll notice we don't hurry out the back door, most of us. So please stay around and, uh, and stick around and get to know us better. You know, uh, it's, it's a, a time where uh, we are, because of our belief in Jesus... Uh, the staff has said, you know, if we really want to see the kind of uh, church and rely, relationship with God that Jesus teaches about, we've got to learn to teach like him. And, uh, you know, learn to hit how he, he's the one that could, at the same time, he could prevent people from arresting him with his words, or he got them so mad that they arrested and killed him. That with these words, he could comfort those who are hurting deep inside and yet afflict the comfortable who thought everything was okay. He was the one that could take uh, people that were downtrodden and the second class citizens and rise, raise them up to great heights of glory and great heights of importance and take those who thought they were so important and let them know how they really stood before God. That, this, that's a talent. And all of us who uh, preach here uh, realize that we are far from that in so many ways. But we want to learn. And so that's how we came up with the idea of the series of parables on Jesus. We thought, well, Jesus told simple little stories. Maybe we can imitate that. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever tried to write a parable, but it's hard to do. I mean, he was a master of saying very difficult things in very easy ways. So we're going to let him tell the parables. We'll try to explain them, okay? Because we can't. But to be transparent, we were all sitting around uh, deciding who's going to do which parable. And in my, you know, everybody says, John, you got to tell us how you really feel. I'll tell you how I really feel, okay? Because all these people are going, I want this parable, I want that parable. And they said, John... We want you to do the parable of the sowers and soils. And to tell you the truth, and when I first heard it, no, I didn't say anything. But I was like, how many times have I heard that parable? How many times have I taught that? And then I started thinking, you know, there are some people that it's going to be new, but there's a lot of you out here that... You know, every, if you're a part of a Bible talk, you heard it every time, you heard it ch- preach, you heard it, and you go, okay, so I want to challenge us, okay? I want to challenge you. How do you react when you hear something for the thousandth time? All right? Could it be, oh, no, not again? Or maybe it's, Cool story, bro. (laughs) So the challenge today is the same for all of us. Will I honestly search my heart? Honestly. That's a good, that's an important word. Search my heart and my life for what Jesus is trying to teach me. Because in his parables, he talks about, and we'll talk in a second, he talks about groups of people, but he talks about individuals, and everyone has to respond to Jesus based on where they are. And the, the power of this parable is that in a very simple little story, Jesus shows us where each one of us stand before him, before a relationship with God, and most of us, we're sort of a hybrid. We're a mongrel. So whether it's the first time or the thousandth time, we all 
are in this parable. And the challenge is, is will I continue to see myself in this parable? So if you heard it from the first time, for the first time, you'll go, whoa, okay. You heard it for the thousandth time. Am I honestly going to let that this still applies? You know, it's one of the parables. Um, one of the parables that is in uh, both all of the what are called synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because they're the parables that deal, I mean, they're the gospels, not the parables, but one of the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because they're the ones that deal with the parables of Jesus. John doesn't. John, Gospel of John is more worried about what, how Jesus preached and some of his individual, what they call, discourses. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is one of the parables that's in all three, almost word for word. All three of the apostles, when they first wrote down what we need to learn to become like God or to learn about God, thought it was important that we hear this over and over again. But the challenge for me, too, is with a parable like this, is how to help people in our society whose experience in, in farming, probably the closest experience they have to farming is that. <laughs> Our idea of finding, of, of raising fruit is going to Publix, Aldi, wherever you go, Walmart, and going down the aisles, picking up fruit that's already been harvested. Now, for some of us, like I was raised in a teeming metropolis of 5,000, and I lived on the outside of Carmel, Illinois, and we just had miles and miles of cornfields and soybean fields behind us, where my, my parents were raised, uh, Rattle, Illinois, where my dad, R-A-D-D-L-E, Rattle, okay, uh, the, the, the largest population that they have recorded ever was 13, okay, and uh, my mom, the largest, largest Jones Ridge, the largest population of that teeming metropolis was 24. The largest ever they ever know about. Right now it's down to four. Okay. And it's just surrounded by, corn, by fields. Corn and soybean for as long as you can see. And sometimes you look back, you won't see a house. There won't be a house for miles. You won't have a neighbor back this way for miles and miles. Maybe down the main road you have one a quarter mile down the road. But they understand the parable of the soils. Because if you understand anything about farming, is that farmers don't work hard because of what they already have. They work hard for what they hope to get. See, when you wake up as a farmer, and we talk about the parable of the soils, you can't say, I don't feel like doing this today. Because in farming, you have little uh, notches of time where you can plant, where you can fertilize, where you can do all the things you need to do. And, and it has to be done during those times. No matter if it's perfect weather or not, it has to be done during that time or you've lost a whole season of harvest. When I was in college, you know, that was uh, back in the 60s and 70s. So everybody wanted to go organic and be back on the farms. And I'd sit there and laugh because I'd bet how long they'd last. Because <laughs> everybody thinks being a farmer is this glamorous thing. Until they realize they don't get any vacations, especially if they're dairy farmers. They don't have any time off. You can't take a day off. You have to do the same thing day after day. Why? Because if you don't milk your cows on a day, the, the females, the cows, yeah, of course, you understand bulls and cows. Cows would say, cows will go, okay, I don't need to produce any more milk. And so you won't get any more milk until you get, they get pregnant again. Then you have to go through all the pregnancy and go through all this stuff. And so you lose. See, and a lot of times I think what it is, I think Jesus is trying to help us, is that our lives are like farmers. And like soils, we'll look at. That there are things that happen in our life that we really don't have the choice of saying, I don't want to do this. Or I'll do this if I can see what I get out of it. Right now, I talked to my cousin in southern Illinois, and they're having rains. They're supposed to have eight inches of rain. And eight inches of rain down there is a little bit different than here because it doesn't flow like it does here. And Perryville, yeah, that's right. I see Joe Vogel over there. He's across the Mississippi River from where my 
uh, relatives live. And you get eight inches of rain, six to eight inches of rain, and that rain will sit on the farms for a month before it drains. Which means that the crops that they work so hard for may or may not grow. But that didn't stop them from being a farmer every day. And that's why it's so important as we go through this, even no matter where you, how you've heard this, you've got to ask yourself, am I in this for what I can get out of it? Or am I in this for a greater, greater reward? And Daniel talked about it, for the relationship of, with God I can have forever, no matter what's happening right now. And that's a hard decision. And we'll go through the soils because as an old insurance uh, advertisement when I lived in Washington, D.C., the the advertisement was, life never promised it would be easy, and life never promised it it would be fair. So you have to buy my insurance to cover it. (laughs) Teens. Were you like that? Let's see if I get this going the right way. Nope, I don't know. Anyway, go on and go back. Anyway, no, nah, it's okay. We'll go there. It's fine enough. Are you going to sit there and just be bored? The rest of us, we can sit there and be bored, or are we going to be farmers? So let's go to the parable. The parable is simple. Well, let's read it. As a farmer went out, to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. And it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they grew up I mean, because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. But still other seed fell on the good soil, where it, was, where it produced a crop, 160 or 30 times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, what would you do if I said, okay, I'm done? In Luke's Luke's account, Luke chapter 8, it says, People had come from their towns and from all around the region to hear Jesus. And he just said this parable and then walked away. And you got to remember, they had to walk everywhere. They didn't have horses. That wasn't until much later. They didn't ride donkeys. And even if you did ride a donkey, it was very... If you've ever ridden a donkey, it's not nice. It's not easy. And it's very bumpy. And it, was only, it went really slow. So some of them traveled for hours. And this is what Jesus gave them for all their trouble. I wonder what Jesus would do if he came here. And so, you have this, they walked, they took hours, and it seems like all of them were just sitting around wondering, like, hmm, I wonder what that means. But there's a group of his disciples who immediately went up to him and says, what does that mean? Because the thing is, as we go through these parables, and as you go through your Bible studies, we go through life, we've got to understand that Jesus wants seekers Willing to ask, willing to seek answers, not be spoon fed, not rely on a Sunday morning sermon or a few little times together to be our, you know, it be how we're fed. He wants people to really desire a relationship with God, not sit with their hands folded and say, I've got it all down. And we're not to listen to him like this. One more. Hmm. Oh, there we go. It's not Matthew 13. It's Matthew 11, 15. He says, whoever has ears, let him hear. 
To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. You know, it's so easy as we go through the, the, the God's word. And so we're sitting there going, how are you going to entertain us? We play. We want the pipe played. In other places it says, don't be like those who go and hear those who are singers of love songs. You want to be entertained. Jesus didn't tell the parable, any of the parables, the parable of the soils to entertain us. He told the parable to make us look at our lives. To be honest with ourselves. And in our society of, I want everything quick. I want it easy. I don't want to work too hard. It's a big challenge for us as Americans. And we'll deal with that in a second. Okay. I think I need to go back one. How do I do that? Well, here we go. Because, see, there's a group of people that come and we come. And this is some of us. This can happen. This, I call this is American Christianity. But it's Christianity all the world because it happened. Jesus says, though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah, over 700 years before Jesus Christ was born prophesied how people would react to Jesus. He says, you will ever be hearing, but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. For the, this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have, their closed, they have closed their eyes. This is right after he gives this parable. Where he doesn't even explain. And he's challenging all of us to say, wait a second. This, it's not a matter of intellectual understanding that God wants. You know, some of us say, oh, I'll do this if I know more. Or I don't, I'll know more. It's not a matter of intellectual understanding for us. It's a matter of our hearts. So the question, whether it's the first time or the thousandth time. What will we do? Of course, Jesus, if you come to him, he will tell us what he means. Because look at the explanation. It says, listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on the rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only for a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. And the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it. Making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Pretty pretty simple, isn't it? Really didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what God is talking about. But it does take an open heart. He says, you know, we can be the hard soil. Have you ever met the people that no matter what is said, no matter what is presented, they're not going to listen? It doesn't matter what kind of proof. It doesn't matter what you show. It doesn't matter. We saw it with the birthing issue with Obama years ago. You see it with so many things today. I'm not going to get into politics here. That no matter what is shown to me, I will not believe it. 
I will not think it's true. It doesn't matter how much proof you have. And in our postmodern world, that is the way that our, our kids are being trained in schools, in everything else, is that they won't believe what God said. It's already been programmed in them. The common core uh, that's in there, that's ingrained in it. And as parents, if you have kids in school, you've got you to gotta work hard to overcome that because it hardens the hearts. And religion hasn't helped at all. And I'm not talking about Christianity. I believe Christianity is fine. But religion that calls itself Christianity, that is bigoted, unwilling to listen, unwilling to love, stuck in their traditions, has not helped that situation at all. And that's why it's always up to us. Is Are we going to look at our hearts? Why? Because God is clear. There's a battle going on right now for your hearts and your minds while you sit there. And it says in 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 4, The God of this age has blinded the minds of those who are unbelievers, who are unwilling to believe, so they cannot see the glory of Christ. Right now, God, that Satan, the God of this age, you know, everybody says, oh, the world is God and Lord. Not, well, it is in one sense, because God's over all, everything, is a kingdom. But Satan is the one that has this world, and he's blinding our eyes. If we want to un- not be believers, he will make sure we're not believers. And he will blind us. Ephesians 4.18, look at this one. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance That is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Wow. Do I have a hard heart? I have to ask myself that all the time. Am I letting the God of this age win? We'll get more into it in just a little bit. Second. Pretty simple. Oops. Opportunities missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. (laughs) Because the second soil is rocky soil. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around it. I couldn't bring a plow up here and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, if you look at Israel, it's a very rocky place. So wherever they plow, they have rocks. And guess what you have to do with rocks? If you, in those days, today they have nice machines that come up and pick out the rocks for you. But in those days, those people would have to go and they would take things. But you're wondering what you're doing. All right. And Simon, you can go talk to Tony. All right. Does anybody know what this is? What do you do with a hoe? You don't? You're not Santa Claus with a ho, ho, ho. You take hard soil and you dig and what do you do? You get things out. And if the soil is really hard. And you can have a pickaxe, too, which is pointed. Okay? This is not a pickaxe. It's about eight pounds, nine pounds. And you have to go. (laughs) And guess what you have to do then? After you get out, you have to take the other end and rip rip the rocks out. What's this? No, it's not. It's a spade. You know what the difference between a shovel and a spade is?
spades is so you can cut through hard things easily, more easily. And it's hard work. Then you get all that stuff up. You can't have a leaf rake. You know these little, little, little flimsy leaf rakes? Which are good to get leaves up. But you need something that's strong. And you've got to get in there and pull that all up. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes doing it when you don't feel like it. Because the rocky soil for us, I, call, I think the most evidence of rocky soil in our life is yes, but. You know, Jesus tells many parables about people making excuses. But think of all the excuses. You know, we, we enjoy, we love coming to church, we love the singing, maybe hear the word, and you go, but, but then you face life as it is. It says, when trouble comes, or persecution. You know, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Anyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In other words, if we're not receiving persecution, there's something with our, wrong with our desire to live in Christ Jesus somewhere along the line. You see, because other people... But well, first of all, life as it is isn't fair. We all bring baggage into Christian life. We all, and, and, and why say about excuses? Because here's what I've heard. I've always been that way. How about this one? My culture. Or, you know, you come up with uh, tons of excuses. I don't want to take too much time here. But, you know... It, take, it says that to get rid of rocks, you've got to dig deep and you've got to work hard. That means we've got to take time for each other and help with each other. It's not the American consumerism where I'll just fit it into my schedule. It's stopping what we're doing and helping each other. Dig deep through the Word. Dig deep in prayer so we can pull those rocks out. So instead of making excuses, we have victories as rocks are pulled out. And then we have American consumerism, the soil with weeds. You know where we add religion to our lifestyle. But I don't like what Mark says. He said, but they, the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things chokes it out. You know... Where I usually see this, and I call these the if statements. If I had more, if my situation was, I'm filling the blanks. If, you know, if uh, if I had if this, this if this was different, and the weeds that come up, I, I hear I, the other day I was talking to somebody. He says, "Yeah, I'm going to buy this big." big car, and I'm going to this. And I said, well, why are you doing it? I said, first of all, I can't afford it. Yeah, I can. I said, okay, great. You can afford it. You can do it. Okay, he said. And second was, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to, you know, it's going to be, you know, he put all this spiritual stuff around it, and I just stopped him. I said, just be honest. <laughs> you want this. And that's okay if you can afford it. But you can't let the desire for other things choke out what it means to be a Christian. And we have so many weeds. Just drive down the 595 and all the billboards and you can see all the weeds that are being planted. Watch TV. Or you can DVR it or whatever you do and go through the commercials so you can miss them. But each one of us has weeds. And all your weeds are different than mine. But they're still weeds. And, you know, if you you have weeds, we got great things. (laughs) Now, I'm I'm enough of a naturist that I pull most of the weeds in my house because I don't want to use too many many, uh, chemicals. 
But you know, if you don't use Roundup and you don't pull out the weeds the right way, guess what happens? The roots are still below the soil. And you know what it does? It takes work and it takes effort and it takes to get the roots out of our lives. We got to dig out the roots of the materialism that is a part of our life. Because just because we live in the United States, I'll tell you. And I'll tell you this story. This is true. 2000, we, uh, the staff that was on staff here, we got to hear a missionary from India. His name was Paul Brand. He wrote some, he's written some great books, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, where he takes our human body and he compares it to the body of Christ. He has one which is, doesn't sound like an exciting book. It's called The Gift of Pain. Because as a doctor who deals with Hansen's disease or leprosy, where people who don't, can't feel any pain at all, how it destroys their life, and it's a gift to feel pain, and do we look at pain in our life as a gift from God to train us, or do we get a bad attitude? Same year, a group of uh, missionaries came over from India, and they were at a meeting, and someone asked them, it wasn't me, but I was around, they asked them, well, what do you think? And you know what their first question was? How do you keep disciples in the United States faithful? How do you keep people in the United States faithful with all the temptations they have with things and money? How do you answer that? And when Paul Brand was asked, where would you want to raise your kids? In India or United States? He says, oh, I'd raise them in India. At least they know what their enemy is there. American consumerism, where we choose a church based on do we like the preaching, do we like the music? Oh, you know, it fits my schedule because I don't want to get up at 9. I want to get up at 10. You know, these are all weeds, and it'll choke us out. And after, I won't use everything. Because some things Roundup doesn't work on. Woody plants. So you got to get more. You got to really cut it off. Are we willing to cut off anything in our life that's preventing us from being fruitful? Oh, I'm not saying it's easy. It's hard work. You got to make sure you're cutting off the right thing, too. (laughs) And then when you're left, There's still stuff below the ground. So what you got to do, you got to grind it out or use stump out. (laughs) Because if you don't get rid of what's under the ground, it's going to come back and bite you. I have to ask myself, am I willing to work this hard? Am I willing to, to cut through the hard soil, pickaxe the rocky soil, drag it all out, hoe, round up, pulling, stump out of what's in my life so I can become the good soil? Because the good news isn't that you and I are any one soil. The good, the good news is that in spite of what's in our life, we can become good soil. And that's why we need each other. That's why we need to take the time. You know, uh, one, of the things, the, one of the main things that sociologists are facing right now, they wonder what's going to happen, is that the average male over 45 years old, or 40 years old, I think it's now, 45, has no friends. Except maybe his wife. And I say maybe his wife because the condition of many marriages in the United States, you're not quite sure even the wife's a friend. What's that going to do to us men? Where we don't take the time to listen, help. Because we're in a hurry. We've got to get this done. We've got to get that done. We've got to get this done. 
Women tend to have better relationships, but now they're getting involved in their time schedule being so busy. They don't take the time. So the more we have, as much, I don't know if you ever went to uh, Tomorrowland in Disney, where you used to drive through and they'd say, oh, look, you're going to have all these things. You'll have more time. You'll have more time. Everything we've added has taken more time away from us. And what has it done? It's in Christianity, it's made us a Sunday morning. And maybe if you feel like it, because may, you don't want your, you know, your kids and stuff, maybe you come at midweeks. Instead of a, I am going to do whatever it takes to become good soil. I'll get the spade. I'll get the pickaxe. I'll get the roundup. I'll get the stump out. I will do whatever it takes. And some of these things are persistent. We all have what are called persistent sins. That you think you've dealt with them once and guess what? They come up again. But guess what? The good news is that God says we can have the fruit of righteousness if we're willing to do this. But that's why we need each other. The parable's simple. There's four different kinds of soils. But the reality is each one of us has each one of those soils in our life. Sometimes I'm hard. Sometimes there's rocks. Sometimes there's weeds. But I always want to be good. So the question for us as as Jesus ends his parables, he who has ears, let him hear. Not just what soil are you, Sometimes that doesn't take a rocket scientist. But are we missing opportunities? Because it's dressed in overalls. And it looks like work. And it looks like work. And are we willing to help each other? Christianity is not meant to be. I mean, I don't care what American Christianity, this personal relationship with God, that phrase is never in the Bible. Personal relationship with God is not found in the Bible. You can look, I've looked, I've looked in the Greek, I've looked in everything. It's not in the Bible. It's always we. We come before God. We teach and admonish one another. We encourage each other. And part of this becoming good soil is who you're going to allow in your life to talk to you honestly. Talk to you kindly. And if they're not kind, then you deal with it the way the Bible says. You talk to them so that they learn how to be kind. So that we can all become the good soil. And right now we have a great opportunity. Because even with all of our work to become good soil, there's one thing that we can't do. We can't change who we are. Because even with all this work of trying to help getting the spades out and all the other things out here. Romans 3.20 is still true. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Doesn't matter what we look like on the outside, how much work, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Only God can bring a change to the very nature. Let him who has ears, let him hear.